Welcome, everybody, to our first edition of Overflow. We are so glad that you're joining us, whether you're watching this on Sunday night or whether you're watching it another night during the week. We are just glad that you're joining us for our first edition of Overflow. What I want to do tonight before we get into what we're going to do is just sort of give you a bit of an overview of Overflow. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what it is, about why we're doing it and why we think it's important. And then I want to give you a, a bit of a, an overview of how we're going to do what we're going to do. First of all, what in the world is overflow? Well, the idea is that we want to build on uh, whatever it is that we talked about at the, the Athens Church Christ in our Sunday morning worship time, whatever the sermon was about that morning. We want to take that text or take that topic, and we want to go a little bit deeper in our application of whatever that is. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Uh, you're already probably thinking, well, well, Mark, I don't, I don't go to the Athens Church of Christ, and so I didn't hear uh, the Sunday morning sermon. Or maybe you do go to the Athens Church of Christ, but for some reason you, you missed that particular Sunday. Listen, uh, you do not have to have listened to Sunday morning sermon to, to benefit from overflow. However, uh, we're going to be doing a couple of different things to help you if you missed it. Uh, for one, I'm going to link in the comment section uh, a link to the worship video, the live stream video from this morning, where you can go back and watch the sermon if you would like to do that. Or if you really don't have the time to invest in doing that, every, uh, every time we do overflow, I'm going to go and do a brief review at the very beginning of our overflow time to, to kind of bring you up to speed on what we talked about that morning. So you don't have to have watched uh, that sermon or listened to the sermon uh, that particular Sunday morning to benefit from overflow that night. So I want you to clearly understand that. This, this is designed not just for our church family. This is designed for uh, folks all over Facebook and all over YouTube, uh, people who want to grow in their, their knowledge of the Word of God, but even more than that, in their practical application of God's Word to their lives. So that's kind of what Overflow is. Every Sunday night about 5 o'clock, I'm going to post a video like this one uh, to our church's Facebook page and also to our YouTube page. And uh, we're just going to, we're going to try to go deeper into an application of the Word of God. Now, why do I think this is important and why am I doing this? Uh, I have been convicted for a long, long time that it is it is just very easy for churches to pretty much become listening societies. What I mean by that is, you know, it's just so easy to come to church uh, or to watch a live stream. Now, right now, it's not all that easy sometimes to come physically to church, but but to watch a live stream, to be a part of the assembly in some way and to listen to the sermon, to listen to the Word, and then to really not do anything with it from there. And I don't think it's that we intend for that to happen. I don't think that we come to church thinking, well, let me, let me listen to this sermon, and let me listen to this text, but I don't intend to do anything with it. I don't think that's the case at all, not with the Christians that I know, and probably not with you either, right? I think what happens is, uh, we have good intentions when we come on Sunday and we take in the Word and we take in the sermon and we, we think, you know, there's some things I really need to do with this and our t intentions are good. But then Monday comes, right? And life just comes and smacks us and whatever plans and intentions we might have had that Sunday, man, by Monday, we barely even remember what the sermon was about. And that's just reality. I'm not being critical. That's just the way life works sometimes. So overflow is going to be designed to try to interrupt that pattern of life getting in the way of our doing the things we know we need to do when we hear the Word of God. Uh, overflow, is, overflow is going to be designed to help us take the message from Sunday morning, whether we, we heard it live or not, to take the text from Sunday morning and to really say, all right, here's some things I need to do based on this text. Here's some things in my life that need to be different. And here are some practical things I can do to, to help God's Word take root in my life so that I can be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. We're going to talk more about that as we dive into the text we're looking at this week here in just a moment. So that's that's kind of what overview is, uh, overflow is. That's sort of why I think it's important. So how are we going to do this? 
Well, every week I'm going to do this video and we're just going to go a little bit deeper into an application of whatever we talked about that morning. Uh, we'll do a brief review of the sermon for those who uh, missed it or for those who heard it, but life has already slapped you in the face and it's kind of already kind of fuzzy by Sunday night or whenever you watch it. Uh, we'll do a brief review of the sermon, uh, the kind of things that we talked about. And then I've got some, some application questions that I have put together that I'm kind of going to, kind of going to walk through. Uh, with you. I will put these application questions in the comment section so you can have them and you can see them. And we're just going to walk through those questions together. Now, here's how I think you can get the most out of these videos every week. All right. Um, I'm hoping that you may decide you just want to do this as an individual. You want to watch this personally yourself and use this as a devotional time uh, to go deeper into the Word. That's perfectly fine if that's what you want to do with this. It will be designed for you to do that. But, you know, I really hope that maybe this is something you will do with your family, that you will get your, your spouse if you're married, you'll get your kids if they're at home, and you'll, you'll just bring them into this discussion and this conversation. We're going to try to have something every week that will kind of get the kids involved a little bit as well. In some weeks, that's just going to be challenging, but they really need to be a part of this conversation. I, I can envision families sitting around uh, in, in their living rooms doing this together. I can even envision uh, a group of friends getting together at someone's home right now. We can't really gather in large numbers uh, very easily. And so maybe we ought to take advantage of the fact we can gather in small groups. And so I could see uh, groups of Christians getting together and working through the, these videos and these questions and this application together. That's kind of how I envisioned this going. In fact, as we, as we work through the application questions every week, uh, it might be that uh, after we kind of go over the first one, you might want to just pause the video. This is not going to be done live. You can do that. You can pause the video and uh, you can talk about that question and then move on to the second one and so forth and so on. That might be a good way to do it. Uh, again, you don't have to do this on Sunday night. I post it at 5 o'clock Eastern Time on Sunday. You don't have to do these at 5 o'clock Eastern Time on Sunday. Uh, you can do this later Sunday night. You can do this another night during the week or, or whenever it fits your schedule, your family schedule, and your friend's schedule if you're going to get together with a group. Uh, so flexibility is going to be the name of the game with these. Flexibility and just going deeper into some application. Now, let's dive into what we're going to be talking about tonight. I thought for our first week uh, that I would tie it into a text that just fits what we, the point that I'm trying to make with overflow and how important I think overflow is and the reason I think it's important. So this morning, we looked at James chapter 1, verses 19 and following. And the title of my sermon was, Don't Audit Your Christianity. Uh, if you ever audited a class, maybe in college or, or since you've been out of college, you know there's some advantages to auditing a class, right? You get all of the information that the professor is wanting to give you. You get all of the resources that the class is providing for you. And yet, you don't have to do any of the, the reading or the writing or the research or the tests. You don't have to do any of the work. You just get all of the information. And that sounds wonderful. And in some ways, it is wonderful. But here's what I've learned in the classes I have audited over the years. If I don't have to do something with the information I'm receiving, I'm not going to retain it. I'm just not. It's not going to stay with me unless I do something with it. And so when I say don't audit your Christianity, I mean when you come to the Word of God, when you open it up in your living room and you read it, or when you get on a worship live stream at your church, or or you listen to your preacher or your teacher preach or teach, uh, don't, don't just hear information. Don't just listen to receive information. Don't be an auditor of the Word but rather say, you know what? This is the information I'm getting. Now, what do I need to do with this? That's what overflow is going to be all about. And that's what this text in James 1, verses 19 and following is all about. Just to do a brief review of uh, the lesson this morning, I said that there are two, uh, two marks that James gives in this text of a proper handling of the Word of God. 
Uh, one of those marks is if you're going to handle the word properly and not just audit it, uh, just hear it and do nothing with it, if you're going to handle it properly, you must receive it properly. There's got to be a proper reception of the word. And James says, really, there are three factors involved in receiving the word properly. One of them is, I receive the word with an attitude of submission. Uh, James says in verse 19, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And that's all good advice. But I said in the sermon this morning, all three of those things are really said in the context of receiving the word. When it comes to receiving the word, I need to be quick to hear it. I need to be slow to speak it in the sense that I want to make sure when I speak it, I'm representing God correctly. I want to make sure when I speak it, I am saying what God says, right? And then I want to be slow to anger. When God's word says something that confronts my life in some way, I don't want to bow up my back and get mad and shake my fist at God, but instead I want to receive it with an attitude of submission. I want to submit myself to the Word of God. Another element in receiving the Word of God properly is I need to receive it with purity. Verse 21, James says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word. If I'm going to receive the Word the way I should, there's first some things I've got to put away. The ESV says, all filthiness rampant wickedness. The idea is sin, things in my life that would plug up my ears, spiritually speaking, and keep me from really being able to hear what God's Word says. I've got to examine my life, and I've got to say, you know what? Of course, I'm never going to be sinlessly perfect, and neither are you, but is there some sin in my life that I'm tolerating? Is there some wickedness or filthiness in my life that, that I'm just sort of getting way too comfortable with. I got to put that away if I'm going to receive the word. I got to be willing to receive it with purity. And then third, James says, if you're going to receive the word properly, you also have to receive that word with humility. He says at the end of verse 21, receive with meekness the implanted word. In other words, you haven't arrived yet spiritually and neither have I. We don't know everything we need to know yet. God's still got some work to do in our lives, right? We haven't arrived spiritually yet. And so I've got to receive the word with humility, with a teachable spirit that says, you know what? There might be something I can learn from this text. Doesn't matter how many times I've read it before. Doesn't matter how many times I've heard this preacher talk about it before. What, what is God saying to me? Is there something he might be saying to me that I need to hear? I've got to have humility if I'm going to receive that the way I should. So I've got to receive the word properly if I'm going to handle it properly. But then we talked about a second thing James says in this passage. If we're going to receive the word, if we're going to handle the word properly, we've got to receive it properly, and then we have to respond to it properly. He says in verse 22, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. I can't just hear the word and think there's some blessing in just hearing it. I've got to actually do something with it. I've got to respond to it in some practical way, right? He also talks about three elements of responding to the word properly. One is we've got to be willing to respond to it without deception, without deception. He says, uh, don't be a hearer only deceiving yourselves. Listen, it is so easy to deceive ourselves when it comes to hearing the Word of God. We get on a live stream, we watch a video, we, we come to church, we go to a Bible class, we go to a Bible study at someone's home, and we hear a teacher or a preacher teach or preach, and we open the Word, and we read it, and we hear it, and we close our Bibles, and we think that's it. Listen, we can deceive ourselves. We've got to actually do something with that word. We've got to respond to it without deception. He also says we've got to be willing to respond to it without selfishness. Look at what he writes down in verse 27. He says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction. In other words, when my Christianity is what it ought to be, it's not going to be about me. And my life is not going to revolve around me but it's going to revolve around others. I've got to respond to the word 
with unselfishness. I, I can't be a selfish person in my response to the word. And then last, James says, we've got to be willing to respond to the word without compromise. He says at the end of verse 27, and to keep oneself unspotted or unstained from the world. I cannot let the world squeeze me into its mold. And listen to me, if we aren't proactive, if we aren't intentional, that is exactly what the world will do. It will squeeze us into its mold. And we don't, we don't want that. That's not what our Christianity needs to look like. If we're going to respond to the word properly, we got to be willing to apply the word without compromise. So that's what we talked about this morning. Let's not be auditors of our Christianity. Let's not just be people who hear the word and read the word and do nothing with the word, but let's act on it. And that's what overflow is going to be designed to do. So let's move into some application questions that I have put together based on this text and based on what we talked about this morning. Again, these application questions uh, will be in the comment section. If you'll look down under the video, you will find them there. I'm um, also to our, our church family. They're being sent out to you via email, so you should get these as well today. But hopefully these things will be helpful to you. Here's the first question that I want you to, to think about or to think about in your group as you're, as you're thinking about these questions together. Uh, it might be good for you to share a time when somebody in your group audited a class. What was that experience like? What were some of the advantages that you got out of that? What were some of the disadvantages? If nobody in your group has ever audited a class, what do you think some of the advantages and disadvantages would be? Uh, you might want to even right now stop this video and spend a little bit of time thinking about auditing a class and what that was like and what was good, worked, what worked well, what was challenging, and what are some lessons that we might be able to learn from that? So that's the first question that I want us to think about together. The second one that, uh, that I want us to think about is this. Uh, I mentioned in the sermon, and I mentioned even tonight in our review of it, that it is so easy for the church to become a listening society. What does that mean to you when you hear that? That the church can just become a listening society. And why might that be a problem? You might even talk in your group, do you even think that's a problem? If it is, what might the problem be? What does God really want uh, out of us? Just to hear or is there more going on than that? What are the dangers in our just being a listening society? Spend a little bit of time thinking about that. If you're doing this by yourself, Reflect on that a little bit. Think about your own response to the Word when you read it and when we gather together. If you're in a group, again, think about and talk about these things together. Here's the third question. We're going to read James 1, 19 through 20. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read that. James 1, 19 to 20. James says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Thinking about those verses, how might each of those three commands be helpful in a general way? Uh, being quick to hear, being slow to speak, being slow to get angry. Think about how generally those things might be good. Spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that or thinking about that and reflecting on that. And then this, specifically in the context of receiving the word and hearing the word, how would each of these three challenges apply? What do these three things have to do with a reception of the Word of God? Spend a little bit of time thinking about how practically those three things apply when it comes to the Word of God. Question number four. Uh, read James 1, verse 21. We're going to do that. James 1, 21 says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. Here's the, here's the question to think about. What does putting away filthiness and rampant wickedness have to do with receiving the word? Why is that so important? I mean, why do we have to put those things away if we're going to properly handle and receive the word of God? And then here's the, here's the, here's the question that puts some shoe leather on, on uh, the discussion. What are some practical things that might help us to do this before we sit down to read the Word or before we come to hear the Word? 
what are some practical things we can do to help us make sure that we have dealt with filthiness and rampant wickedness and the sin that sometimes can be present in our lives? What are some things we can do to deal with that before we ever come to the Word of God. Think about that in your group. Come up with some ideas uh, together in your group and, and talk about how those things might be implemented. Here's a follow-up question based on verse 21. What does meekness mean to you when you hear the Word? Uh, I think we all have different thoughts when we hear the word meekness. Honestly, sometimes when we hear that word, the thoughts we have aren't positive. You might even talk about that in your group because I bet somebody is thinking that. What does meekness mean to you when you hear the word? And then what does that attitude have to do with receiving the word properly when it's heard and when it's read? Why is meekness so important? And then go a little bit further in doing some self-examination maybe and say, you know what, is that my attitude when I approach the word? Or do I think I already pretty well have arrived? We would never say that, but I think sometimes we, we sort of think that subconsciously, especially if we've heard a text a lot or we've heard a topic a lot. We think, man, I know everything. I've, I've been a Christian for a blank, blank number of years. I know everything there is to know about this. There's really nothing this, this text can tell me or this preacher or teacher can tell me that I haven't heard a thousand times before. If that's my attitude, and is that going to be a, ch a barrier, perhaps, to learning anything? Is that going to be a barrier to receiving what God's trying to give me in the Word? Talk about uh, meekness and the role that plays. Here's the next question. Look at James 1 and verse 22. James 1, 22 says, But be doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. That really is the heart of this text. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Uh, how might we deceive ourselves? James uses strong language there. How might we deceive ourselves by being a hearer only of the word? What might that look like in a practical sense, especially for those of us who are Christ followers, uh, those of us who are maybe part a part of a church family where we gather and we listen or we get on a live stream and we listen, how might we deceive ourselves when it comes to being a hearer only? What might that look like? Spend a little bit of time thinking about that and talking about that in your group. And then I want us to look at James 1, 23 through 25. These to me are some rich rich verses. And they're kind of funny as well, but they make such a good point. James 1, 23. James follows up with an illustration uh, to his point that we need to be a doer of the word and not just hear it, right? He says in verse 23, 4, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. This guy looks in the mirror and he looks and he he looks intently. I mean, it's not a casual glance. He looks and he sees all the things about his face that he needs to fix, uh, that, that, that he can fix, right? He sees all this thing, these things that need some work. He looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24, for he looks at himself and then he goes away. And at once he forgets what he was like. He looks intently, he sees the problems, but he goes away and he doesn't do anything about it. Contrast that with verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty, just like the other guy, the guy in the previous two verses, he looked intently into the law. So does this guy. The one who looks intently into the perfect law, the law, law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but being a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Here's the question. Uh, before I get to uh, the, the two questions I want to ask based on those verses, here's an optional activity if you've got some kids in your group or in your family. You might get out a, a mirror. Probably all of us have old mirrors just sitting around. I can think of one right now we've got down in our basement. You might just go get that mirror and, and help your kids to, to see the point that James is making. That, you know, when you see something in the mirror, when you look in the mirror and you see a big old piece of whatever you know, in your teeth, 
and you see that, help your kids to visualize that. When you see that thing in your teeth, when's the time to fix it? When you see it, right? When you look in the mirror and go, wow, what is that? It might be time to floss, right? It might be time to get that out of your mouth, to fix the things while you see them. Help them to, to see the point James is making. Uh, use your creativity. Some of y'all are incredibly creative people. Uh, do that with your kids. And uh, hopefully that object lesson will help them to see the point James is making. When you, when you look into the mirror of the Word and you see things about your life that need some work, the time to do that is when you see it. Don't walk away. Don't go away and, and have good intentions. But do something about what you see. Here's the questions based on that text. James compares a hearer only of the Word to somebody who looks in the mirror and goes away and forgets what he saw. We would never do this physically. At least I hope we wouldn't, right? Most of y'all that I see at church and that I see on my Facebook page, y'all look pretty good. It looks like y'all shave once in a while and y'all clean up sort of nice and, and you, look, you look pretty presentable. We would never do that physically. We fix problems when we see them in the mirror, right? So why is this so easy to have this happen to us spiritually if we'd never do it physically? Why is it so easy to have it happen spiritually? Spend some time thinking about that and talking about the, that in your group. Why is it so easy to, to see the problems, but then to never fix them? And then a second follow-up question. Our church gatherings seem to be almost set up for this to be a challenge, and I think that's absolutely true. We see things in our lives on Sunday that need to be addressed, but we forget about them by Monday. We kind of talked about that earlier. And here's, but here's the, the shoe leather question. What are some practical things we can do to keep this from happening? What are some practical things we can do to interrupt the loop of hearing and then forgetting when life comes on us? What are some things we can do? Obviously, overflow is going to be one of those things. But I'm thinking, in addition to that, in your family, in your life, in your circle of friends, what are some things, practically speaking, that we can do uh, to keep this from being a problem in our lives? And then the last two questions. Uh, the seventh one is this. What is your biggest takeaway from this passage of Scripture? Take a few minutes. If you're doing this by yourself, write it down. My biggest takeaway from this, this text is, and then write it down. Try to make it uh, uh, maybe one sentence if you can, but a complete sentence that just sums up what you're taking away from this text. If you're doing this with your family or if you're doing this with a group, just go around the group, go around the room and say, hey, this is what I'm taking away from this text. This is the biggest point I see James making that just speaks to me so loudly in my life right now. Take a few minutes and do that. Allow each person in your family or your group to share. And then here's number eight. Again, it's one of those shoe leather questions where we put the rubber to the road, right, in, in putting these things into practice. Other than committing to participate in overflow, uh, that's just a given. I hope you'll commit to doing this, not just tonight, not just this week, but every week. Listen, I know some weeks are going to be hard, I know some weeks their life's just going to come at you 110 miles an hour. I understand that, and it might be a challenge for you. But I hope you'll commit to this. This is not going to work. It's not going to be magic in your life just watching this video. It will not be magic in your life unless you commit to doing it and commit to investing in it and to really putting yourself into it. I hope you'll commit to that. I, I, I will give you the best I've got every week, and, and I pray you'll give me the best you've got and give the Lord the best you've got as well. So other than committing to participate in overflow, what is one thing, not two things, not three things, don't overcomplicate this, some of y'all may be like me and you're, you're list makers and you think of all these things that you want to do. One thing, what one thing other than committing to overflow are you going to do this week, not next week, this week to help you be a doer of the word and not a hearer only? What one thing are you going to put into practice this week? And then I, I also ask, when are you going to do it? See, it's one thing to say, this is what I'm going to do. This is the one thing. I'm going to put this into practice. If you don't schedule it, if you don't put it on the calendar and say, I'm doing it right here, you're not going to do it. Uh, I, don't ask me how I know that because I, I've done that so, so many times. 
name that one thing, and then schedule it and say, I am doing this at this time on this day. And I promise you uh, that will help you to put some shoe leather to this. Well, we're just about at the 30-minute mark. I don't really want to go too much over that, so we're going to wrap this up for this week. I hope this will be a blessing to you. I am excited about this. Uh, again, my passion for several years has been for us to do something beyond just sitting and listening to the Word, to put it into practice in a practical way. I, I'm passionate about it. I, I, God has just convicted my heart about this. I want, I want to do this in my own life. I want this in your life. I think our churches, listen, I think even in the midst of this pandemic, our churches will be different if we'll be doers of the word and really take it into our hearts and let it transform us from the inside out and then put it into practice. I think our churches will be different. I think our communities will be different. I think our world will be different. But it all starts with you and it starts with me and us making a commitment to doing this on a regular basis. Thanks for joining us this week. Lord willing, we'll do this every Sunday and every week where we'll dig into the Word and do our overflow together. God bless y'all. Have a great week. If I can help you in any way, send me a private message this week. I'll be glad to help any way I can. God bless.